Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, today's presentation is um, by Danielle Carlock about the Maricopa Seed Library. And uh, the purpose is um, inspiring and equipping the community to create habitat at home. And so Danielle Carlock, who is currently our chapter treasurer, um, she's been gardening in the desert for about 10 years and has a native plant garden in Scottsdale with over 150 species. Um, she recently founded the Maricopa Native Seed Library as a way to distribute free seed to the community and to promote the use of native plants in the landscape with a special emphasis on supporting pollinators. She's taught biology at the high school and college level, and she's currently a library faculty member at Scottsdale Community College. So thank you very much, Danielle, for joining us tonight and letting us know more about the fabulous Maricopa Native Seed Library. Take it away. Thanks so much for having me, and thank you to everyone that's come tonight. Um, my email address is there, and the webpage for the Seed Library is on this slide as well. I'm going to go ahead and advance it. And so uh, just to get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about why I decided to start the seed library. And, you know, of course, I have the interest and background in native plants and doing a lot of gardening here. But some of the things that really inspired me um, to get moving on a native seed uh, project was that, um, you know, there's so many threats to our wildlands and the native plants and the other and the wildlife that's there. You know, we see our large fires, uh, drought, all these sorts of things. And so that inspired me to be thinking more about getting native plants into, you know, our, our more developed areas. And then as I, you know, look around at those developed areas, um, I go bicycling a, a lot in my neighborhood, especially. I see a lot of these um, home landscapes are really inert. Like they may only have, you know, a handful of species and some of them might be native and some of them might be non-native, but they're not necessarily the most um, wildlife um, providing or attracting or supporting plants that you could choose. So I think of those land or they're, or they're all gravel, like total gravel or um, um, all grass. And those don't really support uh, much in the way of wildlife. So that was another thing that inspired me was, I wanna change that, I wanna to work towards changing that. And then uh, compounding that problem is a lot of native plants are not commercially available here. I just drove down to Tucson again um, for my annual visit to get plants down there because I cannot get a lot of them here. So I wanted to work on that too. And then, um, you know, Doug Tallamy has written a lot of books along these, along these lines about habitat at home and the importance of it and the urgency of it. And this idea, um, his homegrown national park idea, he's basically saying, you know, our wildlands are so fragmented, they're so small that they can no longer, they will no longer be able to really do what we need them to do to support wildlife. So we need to do it where we live in all of our urban and suburban areas and that rural uh, wild interface, wildland interface. And so he's talking about uh, folks developing, you know, interconnected um, habitat at home. And that's sort of all these things are why I founded the Sea Library to try to help people remove as many barriers as I can to get folks to do this. So we'll be talking about a lot of those barriers I've been trying to remove as I go through. And on the slide is just some pictures of some really amazing native plants that are not available commercially here in Phoenix, at least that I have found uh, any of these three, I had to get them elsewhere. I couldn't get them in Phoenix metro area. But they're here, they're native to here and I've been collecting them, but they're not, you can't purchase them at the nurseries here. So habitat at home. So I talked a little bit about this already, but you know, there's, there's so many threats to our wildlands. And on top of that, we have the threat multiplier of climate change that's compounding all of those problems on, on top of everything else. So I feel a real urgency about this matter. And so I've been trying to do as much as I can, as, as quickly as I can to try to work toward it. Um, and I've really been inspired again by a lot of what Doug Tallamy, you know, writes about. And, you know, he just has some of these really good sort of phrases that get right to the heart of it, you know, and it just, and it's so, even though he's, you know, a scientist with a PhD, he uses a lot of plain language and it just really gets to where we're going. And he says, you know, what you have in your yard 
what you choose to put there, it influences what can live around you. You know, like, so example with this, um, the, the uh, Apuncha that I have a picture of there flowering, if I didn't have that plant or other plants that attracted native bees, I wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to live where I am. They wouldn't have a habitat. They wouldn't have what they need. They wouldn't have pollen and nectar, things like that. So, you know, when I think about habitat at home, I'm thinking of it as kind of a radical, um, different way of thinking about gardening. It's much more expansive, you know, for a long time, humans have gardened to please ourselves aesthetically, you know, what looks good to us, whether it's native or non-native, whether it's doing anything for wildlife or not, what looks good for us. And so really to expand it out to say, well, what can I do intentionally? What choices can I make in my landscape? Not only with the plants I put, put in, but the practices I, I, uh, engage in in my yard to make it more wildlife friendly. Um, and it can be small. That's the thing is it doesn't have to be large. You know, the, we talked about, you know, the number of plants I have in my yard, but that's not necessary to have that many to support wildlife. It can be much, much smaller than that. Um, even potted plants um, in a small, you know, a patio or something like that. So, and also, you know, we know it's good for wildlife, it's also good for us. It's good for us. It's good for our family and community. There's a lot of health benefits to um, gardening, you know, and enjoying um, nature close up in your own home, you know, near in your own um, home landscape. There's benefits, uh, stress reduction, you know, a lot of different um, health benefits that have been shown, you know, to as far as habitat for home. And that that's not factoring in all the other benefits, the ecological benefits, the ecosystem services that are preserved by, um, you know, having these, these plants with us and the pollinators and so on and so forth. So that's really what this is all about. And so now just a little bit about the seed library itself. Um, I just ran into some folks that weren't familiar with seed libraries and weren't sure uh, what they were. Um, because when you think about libraries, you think of having to return what you borrow, right? But a seed library, no, uh, we, we're giving it away and um, that's the goal. And we're not expecting anything in return. Um, seed banks are different. They, they store seed to make sure there is a supply of seed in case of some sort of uh, disaster and things like that. So a little bit different than that. Uh, seed libraries have been typically um, run by librarians like myself, but not always. Um, and uh, seed libraries, now getting a little bit more specific to ours, um, the seed libraries are open to everyone. They are at the Maricopa Community Colleges, but they're open to everyone with some pandemic restrictions still in place. I can talk about that a little bit and the details are on the website and that'll be constantly updated. Um, but we are asking folks and it's a real honor system. You don't have to have a library card. You don't have to have any ID, you just come in you take your three packets and you go out the door and we don't ask any questions and we just hope that uh, people will honor that so everyone can have seeds. Um, and so we're at four of the colleges right now and they're listed there and more information is on the website. So I will um, actually, let me think, is there any questions that have come up that are really pertinent now or I'll, I'll keep going? No, no questions yet. Okay, and we'll have time at the end too. So I just thought I'd just check in. So I want to talk about what went into um, the preparation and planning for the seed library. So this was a long process. It took me about a year and there was also um, some steps to go through because I was applying for this as a sabbatical to step away from my regular duties. So um, the process was at least a year of getting uh, prepared. And one of the things I was doing was a lot of research. You know, I knew a lot of the natives, but I didn't know, I didn't know, I'm still learning. There's so many native species here I don't know if I'll learn them all in my lifetime. So, um, but I engaged in some, you know, learning about native plants and looking around, not only at what I had grown, but what else was out there. I do sign net a lot. I naturalist a lot and just, I hike a lot. So I was out there constantly trying to figure out, you know, what am I looking at? And so um, that was a big piece of it. And then I said, well, I really, I can't offer everything. You know, what are gonna be my criteria? And I landed on these sort of four criteria and of course, because of the habitat at home, species in the seed library should have at least one wildlife value, if not more. The more, the better, but that was what I was going after. And we'll talk more about that. Um, that they generally weren't commercially available because I didn't wanna 
put a lot of effort into ones that you could buy at the nursery, let's say, I wanted to focus on those ones that weren't as, uh, weren't as easy to get. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't have some that are commercially available, uh, but these were the criteria I took into account. I wanted to make sure I was looking at, you know, there's a range of how, how xeric and heat tolerant even plants are um, that are native to our area. I was trying to focus on, make sure I included some of those that are the most xeric and maybe avoided some of the more tender or, you know, plants that needed higher levels of water and things like that, thinking about climate change. And, and that doesn't mean I don't have a few in there that, that have higher needs, but I make sure to specify those. And then if I could, easy to grow from seed. Not all the seeds, uh, not all the plants are easy to grow from seed and I'm still learning about how to germinate some of these, but that was another consideration I made. And so I went through and gathered, I think, I think the target list has over 70 species, but in reality, I think only maybe 40 something have been brought into the seed library so far. And I developed uh, plant profiles. We'll tour the website in a few minutes and package labels. You could see the pictures of the package labels. One of the barriers, I wanted to get, wanted this all to be free. So that's why the seed library model to remove that barrier. Then I wanted to make sure that I provided as much information as I could about the plans to make it as easy as possible. So that's why the, the labels have what they have. But then if you see at the bottom of the envelope labels, the tiny URLs, those connect to a plant profile that, that blows out and has more information. I'll look at one in a minute. So as much information as I can find. And some of them, especially the germination, there's not a lot of information. I'm slowly moving through and testing the different species in the seed library. And then of course the website was developed and the social media was developed. And I have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. So this is an example of what a plant profile looks like um, on the webpage. And so it'll have the names, the name of the plant, English and uh, or the common name in English, and then the Latin name, the scientific name, and then any com other common names I had, including if there were ones in Spanish, um, how easy it is to go from seed pictures of the a plant, um, and then in italics, that's sort of my um, teaser, you know, try to get people interested in, you know, why should they grow this plant, you know, and so that was kind of that, and then in the chart, it kind of breaks down some of the nitty gritty about the plant, um, and then I tried to incorporate recommended use in the landscape for each one and then any references. Oh, so here's the last slide and then we'll tour, I think, uh, the library is the web page and come back. So as far as seed collecting, this is unique, I or some, as far as I know, I don't know really a lot of other seed libraries where they do their own collecting out and about. I mean, I think, I think I've, uh, actually, I've seen presentations of some seed libraries that do have their own seed sources where they grow and collect um, seed, especially for uh, food food plants. Um, but in this case, I'm actually going out onto the Tonto with a permit and also city of Tempe in a few instances and doing collecting there. Um, so because I'm trying to make sure I'm getting genetic diversity in the seed library. Now, that's not always possible for all the species. So we also have um, campus gardens and a home garden that I've been collecting from as well. So, and I've taken some donations or people very generous over the last couple of months that have sent me, I started getting things mailed to me from folks all over the valley when I put out a call for some things I was getting really low on. And the seed processing was something I was doing largely myself last year. And I don't have any you know, mechanized, any equipment or anything like that, uh, other than some screens um, and mostly doing that by hand. Um, some of them are messier than others, like thistle you know, blows around because it's a wind um, dispersed and it's pretty messy. So a lot of that you want to clean outside, but that's sort of um, the lowdown on, um, oh, so there's one more uh, slide before we look at the tour. So, um, the only other thing I just wanted to mention here is that the seed library, we have a, like some other, other things we're trying to do besides be a seed library, and that is education. There were workshops. I did quite a, quite a few of them last year that are recorded now um, and on the website I'll show you. And the plant palettes, we'll look at at least one of those. Um, I'll talk about, more about that in a minute. Uh, demonstration gardens with field guides. I added plants to the Red Mountain campus and the SEC campus. Not all that's shown there, those were there way before I got involved, but I added uh, additional plants into these gardens that are seed library plants as another seed source and as a way that people can come, look at the plants and then go up 
go to the seed library and get get things that they just saw, you know, up close and personal. So now I'm going to attempt to go over to the website and hopefully this will behave. So um, my tabs on the about section, it will give you um, what's new, what's the vision and purpose and where to get the seeds um, and then information on um, where the seeds came from and a land acknowledgement. Um, under, and I kind of, this is not the best, it's kind of a WYSIWYG, you know, I'm not a web um, developer. I don't know how to write code, so I'm using something WYSIWYG. It's not the best. Um, I have, um, I need to do some reorganizing, but the About Native Plants, oh. Danielle, did you switch over to your website? Yeah, oh, you guys can't see it? It didn't switch. Oh, dear, I think I know what it is, okay. So sorry, thanks for letting me know. I think I know what happened there because I told it just to share my slides and not my whole. I think I have to bounce out maybe and bounce back in. I'm not sure here, I apologize. These are the kind of things that are always frightening when you're <laughs> presenting. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, oh dear, okay, it's wanting me to log in, which I don't know why. I need to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so I apologize. You can see it just fine. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so the about, like I said, it just has some general information. Um, learn about native plants, about native plants. Um, that has um, references and links out about native plants. Workshop materials is one place where the workshops live with the recordings and handouts. They're also on YouTube. I think when you click, you'll end up on YouTube. Um, and I wanna to point out there, I'm trying to get these organized in the best way I can, but I've got some palettes here. Um, what these are, let me open the, um, hopefully it'll still show this, I think when I present. Um, what the palettes are doing is an attempt to um, provide, this is like, okay, um, beginner, like starter palettes. I have one for nectar plants and one for host plants. And I also have advanced ones. The nectar ones don't assume any growing from seed because these are plants that you can normally get at nurseries here locally. And so I broke it down by type of plant like trees and shrubs, what the bloom periods are because with nectar, it's really important to have plants, um, a continuous bloom. So you wanna have, and, and a goal is to aim toward three species per season in bloom. So this can kind of give you a sense, you know, what do I already have? And, you know, does it, does it, you know, qualify, does it get me across the whole 12 months with uh, things in bloom? So that's kind of um, a palette. You know, if you're thinking about um, doing some gardening this fall, this is the ideal time is going to be October and you can get, you know, plan out some plants from this. Even if you just get one or two nectar plants in your garden and you have a continuous bloom, you're in a good shape. And then the larval host one, is um, for butterflies and um, moths because they are very specific. They can't reproduce, they can't lay their eggs unless they have the plant that they use, that their caterpillars use or larvae use um, in that location. So for instance, um, if you plant superstition mallow, you'll see the host for all those are different types of moths and butterflies that use, that lay their eggs on Superstition mallow. That one's actually a powerhouse because it's a nectar plant and a larval host plant. So I should probably get another category where I say here, here's ones that meet both. Um, but again, if you can have a couple of host plants in your yard, you'll start to be able to provide for these, um, you know, these insects uh, more than just coming to yard for nectar. They'll be able to reproduce, which is really important because um, nectar alone isn't going to get them where they need to be. So let me go back. Um, I think that the, the uh, biggest, um, you know, the most critical part of the, um, oops, of the Sea Library's uh, website is the plant select, what I call select plants, which is really where you go to learn about the plants in the Sea Library. So how I have this arranged is by type of plant, annuals, food plants, grasses, perennials, we'll just kind of go in and I'm going to click on, um, Tansiaster. And so this takes you to the plant profiles, you know, that I was talking about earlier, um, links to these, um, where you can see all that information about the plant. 
and pictures of the plant. So that's your plant profiles. And again, the tiny URLs on the packets link to these. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you was, let me go back. Um, it's not just the, the profiles, but also some lists. Like if you wanna see which species in the seed library are hummingbird attractors, um, go here and you'll get a list of hummingbird attracting plants. And then it links you out to those profiles of those plants. And then I also wanted to make sure that, you know, you don't have to grow from seed. There's some of these other ones that I don't have in the seed library are also really good hummingbird plants and they're generally available at nurseries. So I don't want growing from seed to be a bar either. If folks want to get involved and don't want to, you know, get too into growing from seed, there's a lot of options still at the nurseries. Um, so then I think that was, and then just the final thing, the resources are a lot of various links, just additional links out. But the demonstration gardens, you have um, the field guides to the plants. So you can kind of see, um, it's another way of present, presenting a lot of the information in the plant profiles, but it's a list of each of the plants and uh, pictures of the plants and what their wildlife value is. So people can walk around and look at the plants in the gardens. So let me go back. I'm gonna go back and get to the PowerPoint. Is there any questions that have come up so far? No questions yet, just a couple comments. Um, first, uh, Ian wanted to let you know that um, uh, he, he still has um, some of the, let me find where it is, the Cucurbita digitata um, seeds for you for the library. Oh. I'm not sure I butchered the Latin name of that. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then Pam Shields let us know um, that uh, she's the proud mama of many huge um, Rustica Sphinx moth caterpillars on two desert willows. Very nice. You know, that's the thing that's really great too about having those host plants. As you can see, the butterflies go through, you know, the whole life cycle. Um, you know, seeing the cat, seeing the larvae is really exciting too. And then seeing the chrysalis. And if you ever get a chance to see them emerge, I saw a monarch emerge in my yard one Christmas. It was one of the most magical Christmases I ever had to actually get to witness that. So, you know, and for kids, you know, it's great for kids to be able to see all that going on in their own yards and be able to follow those things along. And so it's a great learning experience and it, it's really joyful. I can't, there's, I'm so glad that I got into native plant gardening. It's one of the most joyful things I've ever experienced in my life. It's having to have, I should say, having a habitat at home, the joy of that is just really incredible. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, talk a little bit about, you know, in that first year, you know, and I was on sabbatical, so I was working on this full time. Um, we gave out over 3000 seed packets, thanks to my colleagues at the seed libraries that were doing a lot of that work with, um, you know, putting the pack packets out and keeping the inventories and all these sorts of things. We gave out a lot of seed packets at Red Mountain. They were out uh, doing it curbside, which is amazing. Um, somehow, I don't know how, I stumbled into media attention. I, it Somehow um, somebody from the New Times saw one of the seed libraries and then it led to all this other stuff, which was great because it really um, got, I think, uh, more people aware of the seed library and using the seed library. And a lot of nonprofits reached out, Audubon Society, um, the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association. Um, I'm trying to think who else. There's just been um, so many groups that have kind of reached out saying, hey, how can we, you know, partner? And I already had, you know, some partners here at the Plant Society and the Center for Native or Urban Wildlife at um, Scottsdale Community College. So kind of, you know, making all those connections and seeing how we can work together. And then of course the collaboration across the colleges, like I said, I had three of my um, sister colleges that were participating. And um, even to the level now that two faculty are, um, are, in, are training interns to work in the seed library. That one of them is a biology faculty and one is geography faculty. So that's been really exciting. And I think just overall, I wasn't expecting it. I thought, oh gosh, I'm gonna start this thing and no one's gonna use this thing and no one's gonna care. Oh no, you know. And I didn't expect ever that we'd give out this many packets or that, you know, that I'd, that'd be any media attention. So I was really excited to see that there's an interest and maybe the pandemic helped with, with that, you know, and I just, I feel a lot of urgency around the topic of getting um, native plants in our yards and supporting wildlife. So there were definitely challenges and most of these, I'm still living with these challenges and trying to figure out how to surmount them. 
And so one of them is um, one of my flaws as a, you know, as a person and a professional is I take, uh, I, I scale up too quickly because I take on too much. And so probably, you know, somebody from outside of this would have said, what, you're opening, you know, three locations in the first year, like, ah, you know, like start with one and then scale up. But that's not how, you know, it worked for me because I had interest from people and in, at different colleges and I was dealing with the pandemic and trying to get seeds out to people. So I felt like more locations was better than none. So I did scale up more quickly than probably would be advisable. And then that created supply chain logistics where we're still all trying to figure out, you know, okay, how do we get the seed, you know, the, from the collecting to the processing, to the seed libraries, to the packaging, all these steps in supply chain, because librarians are not experts in supply chains <laughs> and all that. So trying to figure that out and keeping the inventories um, and all these sorts of things um, has been a little bit mind boggling. Um, and a lot of it I was doing at, at home on my, you know, I didn't have a lab or a lot of space uh, to work on my, my piece of it. Also there's challenges with germinating these species and a lack of information about what their requirements are. And so I did as much as a librarian, I dig pretty deep and try to find, you know, exhaustive, you know, what are the um, requirements of some of these species? And I didn't come up with information for a lot of them. And, uh, but I've been slowly working on uh, trying to get, get that down, you know, and so that's been a challenge. And then the availability of seed, I ran into, you know, a lot of trouble with having the drought, that the big drought, you know, no monsoon, no winter rains, I think, and no monsoons the year of the sabbatical when I was starting this up. So luckily I'd collected quite a bit before that, but uh, I was struggling this last uh, May and June because we had, had not had rain for so long. So that was a challenge. And the seed ball project, some of you may have participated in, that was a challenge because the seed balls really needed water to germinate, so we weren't getting much. Then we had wildfires. I lost some, um, there's some places I was collecting seed on the Tonto that are were damaged, pretty heavily damaged by wildfire. I did go back out to one area, actually an area I hadn't collected before, but I was told about that's been burned. And of course the, the cacti are gone and, and some of the trees, but a lot of the uh, smaller plants are coming back. There was quite a bit of Believe it or not, ground wild native ground cherries and devil's claws and things like that. Even in the burned area, walking through that burned area and having all that, and I was able to collect seed there. So, but I also had some timing issues and population issues. Timing is in, oh, you know, like if you miss a window, you're, you know, sorry, it's not till next year. You know, like I, I was, I wanted to bring ironwood into the seed library, but I wasn't here in town during that window when they uh, went to seed. So that was it. And I got to wait again until next year. So there's things like that. And some of the, um, some of the wildflowers, the ephemerals, their, their life cycle is so quick that they're, they're up, they're, they're up, they're flowering, they're seeding, they're gone in a few weeks. And if you missed that, you missed it and you got to wait a year, you know, so there's that. And then just populations, like not finding large enough populations for certain species that I just can't collect because of the ethical guidelines around seed collecting. That you have to have a viable population. So those have been some of the challenges. Um, and then another challenge is because there's no, um, we don't keep track of who uses the seed library. Um, there's no way to really reach back out to people to get their feedback. And so I try to, you know, put up different things, you know, at, at the seed library itself, encouraging people to post, you know, send me their uh, stories, success stories or not uh, with the seed. I haven't gotten that many of those back. So that's been kind of another challenge is I, it's, I'm putting it out there into the universe. I don't always necessarily know what's happening with it. Like, boy, would I love to know, you know, if people are getting germination or if they're not and with which to, and all those factors, you know, and how they're, are they sowing indoors, outdoors, you know, all these things. So that's something that's um, kind of a burning question, you know, but I'm still plowing forward. Um, so, you know, as far as advice, I mean, you know, to take on a big project, um, probably I should have been studying project management more in that year prior, but I had so much on my plate just to get to that point, I, you know, that would have been good. Or if there would have been a project manager, you know, someone who had that training that was, um, poor Lisa, I think she ended up being that by default, <laughs> always warning me, oh, you know, you're, about taking on too much and kind of help, trying to help me scale things back a little bit. Um, so, but you know, those kind of things are important, trying to keep it manageable, trying to, you know, it's hard to say no, especially when people are excited about things, 
and trying to stay laser focused, you know, is really difficult. Um, I don't know if anybody's here that's interested in starting a seed library or they or augmenting one with natives. I did a workshop for a seed summit about that very topic that has some additional content specific to that aspect. So that is available, um, you know, in that drop down on the seed library webpage under work. Oh, no, no, that one. Yes, that one is. It is available there. It is available there and also at this link. So that's just some advice. Um, and now, not heeding any of the advice I just gave you, I'm about to launch on launch an even more ambitious project in year two. But I am forcing myself to, to go in baby steps. It's ambitious in, in large part, but I'm starting with a small piece and I'm hoping to work it for a long time. So this is um, where we're going next is taking the idea of habitat at home further and saying, okay, we are in a climate emergency. We're in an, an extinction emergency. We need to get habitat into these our developed areas as soon as possible. And so what I, we have already some good pollinator habitat, like the picture that SEC and some other places have good habitat already. Well, let's connect those because pollinators need like all, like all wildlife, they need interconnected, you know, corridors. When it's fragmented, they can't travel, especially native bees don't have large ranges. They cannot travel far. So interconnected habitat. Also, it allows for, um, it allows for better genetic diversity, um, sharing of the gene pools between when you have fragmented habitats, they can, uh, their diversity can be lessened. So all these sort of things are beneficial. And so the idea is, that um, doing outreach to people, businesses, schools, whatever, along this, whatever this pathway is designated as. So we have these uh, habitats that already exist, we kind of map them out and then kind of see where we're gonna go and then try to outreach to people and give them support to join the pathway. Um, and so that amount of support is gonna vary depending on how many resources I can marshal to this. It may be, lot of support or less support and I can scale it, you know, depending on what happens with that. But the first step is going to be to get pollinator habitat guidelines in place. There's already many that exist from other projects elsewhere and these sorts of things are being done in other places. There's the Northeast has a huge project, 200 towns I think are developing corridors um, in this way. Uh, but we need, our, we need our guidelines that are, are for the Sonoran Desert. So I'm going to be uh, getting a panel of experts together to help inform that then I'm um, working on establishing um, sources of plants and seeds because I'd like to be able to provide that to people who sign up for this, at least as much support as I can given how much, how much resources and support I can marshal. Education, so more education, more workshops and materials. Ideally, oh, I really, my dream is to connect our students to the project with internships from the colleges, going out there and getting involved with the public to do this, that would, that's the dream. And the proof of concept is I'm going to start at SEC and try to map to a, a, some locations that are relatively close to us and show how this could all work. And then um, attempt to get various funding sources to go bigger. And then again, you know, scaling everything depending on how much support there actually is. I mean, some of these pathways, they don't provide a lot of support. They have a web page, they have a map on their web page. You can sign up and say, yes, I'm, you know, adhering to these guidelines and yes, I'm doing this. But I want to provide more support than that, you know, uh, to remove barriers and to get people more involved. So that's that's what I'm looking at um, taking on next. So uh, be watching for this. It's I'm trying to take baby steps and go slow so that I can try to follow some of the lessons I've I've learned so far. And you know, some of the other priorities. Um, I think I touched on this a little bit, but you know, again, we don't know a lot about the germination requirements of some of these species. So get that out there. And that's gonna be another piece of this too. You know, all, everything I've talk, been talking about is getting that out there. And then keep developing the gardens at seeds, as seed sources, because I wanna be able to give seed to folks that join up for the pathway, as well as, you know, for the seed library, have more plants available. These three plants pictured are ones that I really wanna get into the seed library. I have now several Aristolochias on several campuses. It's a post for the pipevine swallowtail butterfly the only thing it uses is pipe vine, the plant. And this is our native pipe vine, uh, but I have not been um, successful in collecting seeds yet. Um, same in the Dudleya, um, oh, there's a 
I think there's a typo there. Um, that one, I have collected seed, but not enough to put it through the seed library yet. So this is sort of, you know, keep expanding the, the plants in the seed library and get them into home landscapes and try to change people's uh, hearts and minds about gardening. So I think, oh, I have one more. I almost forgot about this. This is maybe the most important slide is my call to action for you. And I wanna encourage you to um, now is the time to get going on your fall garden because October is the best month to, to plant because the soil is still warm. So it encourages good root growth, root development, which is important and gives the plant all those months until the heat turns back on again, uh, you know, in the uh, late spring there. So um, start planting. There's a lot of plant cells like Lisa mentioned coming up. You can use my uh, palettes or profiles, get stuff from nurseries, get stuff from the seed library. Um, try to have both host and nectar plants in your space. If you could have at least something blooming that's a nectar source all times a year, even in the winter um, here, because it's so mild and try to have a couple of host plants. I did put just a couple of choices up there of, of nectar and host plants. And those are ones that are commercially available. Generally, believe it or not, velvet mesquite hosts um, a whole ton of different uh, butterflies. Pretty cool. Um, I didn't know that at first. And of course, it's also a keystone species providing lots of other different types of support to wildlife. So, um, so get your seeds, get them from us, um, plant them. If you don't plant, if you don't have time to plant them, or if you've gotten some, uh, give them away to others if you don't have time to plant them. Share the, share the news about the seed library with others. Share the, good, share the news about um, Habitat for Home and the benefits it can provide um, to people. And if you do use the seed library, please give us some feedback about what grew, what didn't. I'd love to have that kind of feedback because it's just kind of a, a empty, you know, kind of a black hole there as far as what I'm putting out. Um, and again, there's so many besides the plants. It's not just the plants, but it's uh, the, uh, the practices that you engage in. So our pollinators, the insect pollinators, and those are our primary pollinators, our bees, butterflies, and moths insecticides kill them. So it's really important if you can start scaling that back or eliminate that using those. Um, you know, there's other things too. Um, native bees need bare dirt to, most of them, not all, but a lot of them are nesting uh, ground, bare, you know, ground nesting. So they need um, bare ground. So that's another one. Um, having um, lots of cover, you know, for, um, you know, lizard those shrubs different things like that that provide cover for things like reptiles and birds so just a lot of things along those lines some of my workshops on pollinator gardening get into that as well and the xerxes society has really good information about that as well so i think with that i think that i've come full circle so i'm going to stop sharing all right thank you in. danielle 